narcissist apocalypse. You've heard of nextdoor.com? Yes, ma'am. Um, I went on there <clears throat> and somebody had said something about her daughter getting um, bitten by a dog. Like, and this was the second time. And she had lacerations and everything. And um, she was like, I don't know what to do. And so I recommended, you know, call animal control and um, file a police report. And then some, uh, some other people were basically saying the same thing. And then somebody says they don't euthanize dogs in this state. And I said, actually they do. And I, and I cited the, um, like the law of the North of North Carolina, it's one bite is free. And the second bite they usually observe. And then sometimes they'll euthanize because it's considered a dangerous dog, you know, if they're attacking the general public. Yeah. And this woman <laughs> just went crazy on me. She said, they do not. You're you're spreading false information. And I and I actually sent a link of the a government website with the, you know, law in it. And I said, look, I'm just telling you that this is I'm just this is this is the, here's the link, the government link. And then she just went off on me like you're just trying to start a fight and blah, 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 blah. And I was very proud. I just kind of stood away out of it. And just kind of didn't engage. Well, good. I'm glad you didn't engage. You know what? It yeah. just makes it worse, right? We've learned that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, hey, Judy, Tim, Diana, thanks for being here. <clears throat> um, so in today's narcissistic apocalypse, we are going to talk about <clears throat> um, intimate relationships with narcissists and toxic people and how, you know, how we get through them and how we thrive. Right. Because sex is probably one of the most common types or methods of gaslighting for a narcissist um, to control and manipulate you. And a lot of times we don't notice it. Um, it's incredibly insidious. But you can't get any more personal and vulnerable than, you know, intimacy and sex. So narcissists typically tend to use sex to manipulate through, you know, psychological means by making you think that maybe something's wrong with you. And when they manipulate, when you get manipulated and controlled through sex, they set us up to think that something is wrong with us so that we blame ourselves. We feel shame. We feel um, very low self-worth. We, we feel very low uh, self-confidence. And we lose our ability to stand up for ourselves because our intimacy is something that we, that, that we, that we, always we, we we rely on it so when when this happens it affects like the deepest parts of us and what happens inadvertently is that we end up isolating ourselves because we don't want to admit or even talk to our friends or loved ones about this because you know what happens if you hadn't had an orgasm what happens if you don't have desire for sex what happens if you feel embarrassed or that your spouse or your partner is disappointed in you and that you feel like something is wrong with you um, you shut down because this is an incredibly personal thing. You believe whatever's wrong with, the, with, you know, your sex life or sex is your fault, which is exactly what your narcissist wants you to believe. The thing, you know, the thing though is, is that what we don't understand is that their pleasure is the most important thing. It's all about how they feel. We subtly, subtly get a message that, you know, we don't deserve pleasure. Maybe we're being punished for behavior, our feelings. We feel rejected confusion um, about what's happening in the bedroom. But the truth is, is that our feelings don't really matter to this person. Um, I'm assuming everyone in here has had sex. I'm assuming everyone in here has had sex with their narcissist. Um, what is, what, did anything sound familiar? Does any of this sound, does it ring any bells for you guys? Can you want to talk to me about it? Because this is a really common thing, especially to happen in, in the beginning, right? Um, because narcissists will mirror our sexuality, right? Um, especially during this love bombing stage. Uh, you know, they kind of become like you. They act like us. Um, so that kind of make, feels like worse in sync. Like nothing could be better. Yes, Diana. I was just going to say yes. I mean, everything you described. But it also, when he played that game for so long and it was like, 
yeah, I went through the what's wrong with me phase, but then he got to where when he would want it, I just wasn't interested in it. And then the games really began. Okay. Okay. Scott, what about you? I think that came right up about Christine when I uncovered the affair and it went right into like a love bombing stage. Mm -hmm. And um, then within 30 days, it was just finished. It was like totally 180 degree, if that makes sense. But um, it was like, how do I say it? Um, You know, to a point, you know, before that, yes, intimate. Um, were there was there more when I uncovered the affair? And yes, that was to deflect what I found. If that makes sense, it totally makes sense. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else want to share? Um, you know, this is what narcissists do. They rely on maybe our pity. And they rely on our tenderness, right? Right, Our tender heart, our empathy. They typically manipulate us into believing that we are terrible, that it's all us. And when this happens, they actually have us in the palm of their hands. We don't, we don't understand it. We don't understand what's going on. So the truth of the matter is, is that when we are truly with a toxic person or a narcissist, we can't win. No matter what we do, this person will never truly be satisfied with us. We will never be good enough in their eyes. And they have to to have something they can hold over you in order to manipulate you. What, what did your, what did your narcissist hold over you? Barb. He was my brother. He was just older than me. Okay. Power. Power. Okay. What about you, Linnea? Scott? Control. Okay. Judy? Tim? Diana? My kids. Okay, that's a big one. Rachel, hi, honey. How are you? I'm home. (laughs) Yay. Good for you. I'm so happy. Thank you. Me too. My gosh. What was this? Like six weeks? Uh, 60 days. Holy cow. Yeah. Um, But I'm home and I'm grateful. Good. um, I would say um, power, control, really my mind, my mental health, finances, my physical health, my body, my dad. Okay. What about you, Jess? Oops, where'd Jess go? Um, I believe that was Judy talking. Um, that was Rachel. Oh, Rachel. Okay, yeah. Everything that Rachel said. Uh, same thing with me. That's what my narcissist held over over me. Okay. What about you, Lori? Were you able to talk? Yeah, ditto. Okay. Lord, um, other Lori. Lolly. Sorry, I'm not checking the chat if you guys are working. Hey, Judy, go ahead. Are you, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I had a hobby of showing working breed dogs in breed and obedience. And I had a litter of 11 and he planned with three attempts, dog and puppy napping in the middle of the night, even though I was outside with them. So I'm going to say my pets and it was cruel. And that was only the beginning. Thanks. I'll pass. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Kelly, your hands up. Are you on mute? What about you, Carrie? I would ditto what Rachel said. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, Nicole P, welcome. Guys, never feel obligated to answer me. If you don't want to, if you don't want to answer, you don't have to turn your mic on. But if you do, and I pass you, uh, you just raise your hand. Caitlin, hi. How are you? So, <clears throat> when we are with someone who, you know, who we live with, that brainwashes us, right? Um, we think that you know they brainwash us to think that we're the problem, no matter what right? Or that certain things are wrong with us. It takes a lot of undoing to be able to see, th see things a little bit clearer. We have to learn what manipulation looks like and we have to learn what that control looked like so that we can get out of it or that we can change it. So I have a quote and I cannot remember who, where I heard this from, but I loved it. It says, often we don't notice with these kind of relationships is what doesn't happen when it isn't there. So a lot of times we are, we, we have grown, you know, conditioned, right? We have been groomed and we don't really under, we don't really notice that it wasn't there because it's never been there. Or we thought that it didn't have to be there. I think is the way that that's the way I take that quote. The truth is, is that sex is always confusing when you're, when you're with a narcissist because, because we never feel good enough. And I, I have a people who came to me saying, no, no, no. In the beginning, it was great. Well, yep, it sure was. Because in the beginning, it was probably all about you until it became, until it became a relationship. So, you know, I've, I've talked with both, you know, men and women, and they, they kind of tell the same story, you know, um, where <clears throat> your body just doesn't feel safe with a person that you don't trust. You know, you can't relax. You can't, you can't figure, you don't, your body is not allowed to figure things out. So you're never able to be um, comfortable. So, you know, the thing is, is when narcissists, they, they um, manipulate things, especially when it comes to sex. You know, if you've lived through the love bombing stage and years of maybe intermittent kind of reinforcements, these kind of conversations really start to mess with your head and your heart. Because in our brain, we know that the, something's not right, but our emotional heart says, oh, no, no, this person loves us. This person cares about us. And that leaves us vulnerable for them to manipulate even further because they, they manipulate us into thinking that maybe we're selfish or inconsiderate for not tending to their needs. So the narcissist is usually projecting their own selfishness onto us, one, making us wonder if we're being selfish, right? That's projection. And a lot of times their um, emotional immaturity does come to the surface, but we don't see it because we have maybe been experiencing different kinds of feelings from this person. Yes, Kelly. Hi. Um, Hi. My, my app keeps going haywire and I wasn't able to even turn the mic on. And I'm sorry. Sometimes, lot of problems. sometimes I know that if you do not have the most current app and we've updated our system and I have a more current one than you or the rest of the, of the, the group has a more current one. I just found this out the other day. Sometimes that can happen. So always make sure that your phone is up to date if you're using a phone. Um, okay. I, I, however, did not know that my Mac didn't automatically update them. So I had to do it. Um, and it's been better. Okay. Um, just really quick. Where can I find the recordings of these? Um, um, it, they will come out on Spotify. Okay. Is there like a Spotify channel for circles or whatever? Or what, what would I yeah. search for to make sure I find it? You know what? Um, when I give you guys a, an exercise to do, I will try to go look at my email because I, I think I do have the older recordings and I'll tell you what they look like. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else that shed some light on there with the love bombing and the, you know, the, the years maybe or the, the, the period of time where you had this intermittent reinforcements of telling you what you liked, what you didn't like, who you were, how you were, you weren't good enough, maybe you were good enough. What did that look like for you guys? Yeah, Tim. Welcome. Like, even the way she kissed me in the beginning, that all of a sudden, it, like, completely changed. And, like, kissing her was, like, I don't want to say repulsive, but it was just, like, it, it didn't match at all. And it just, just felt fake. And it just weirded me out over time. It was just, like, I can't even kiss this girl, you know? Are you still together? No, no, we broke up like two and a half months ago, but we were together six years. 
Okay. Okay. And yeah. when, when did you start noticing something was awry? I guess it was like after a year, she kind of messed with me for a year and then it started going haywire and I didn't realize I was already sucked into something. So um, that brings me, brings me to a good point <clears throat> is that, you know, a narcissist will always know our vulnerabilities. And this may sound contra- uh, counterproductive to what I talked about in my earlier group, which is that we have to learn to be vulnerable in order to heal. But it's a little bit different when, when a person who wants to take advantage of you is taking advantage of those vulnerabilities. So there, I just want to make sure that for those of you who are in my other group, you do understand there's a difference that this is a person who doesn't really care about how you feel. They're just doing it. They're just doing it to do it. And they know what will affect you and reinforce your insecurities and your self-doubt. They know how to exploit your, let's use empathy and our caring, beautiful, wonderful hearts. And they use it as against us. They use it to control us. So how do we thrive beyond? <clears throat> Kelly. Um, I like that you mentioned that because like the first time around dealing with um, a narc, he would always pester me about, you never let me get to know you or you never tell me anything. <clears throat> that was in my 20s and that was just back when I was just very, I don't know, had a wall up, <laughs> a, a wall up with everyone and it didn't matter who it was I wasn't really interested in sharing anything about myself with anybody um it wasn't until two years ago when until he when he came back and we're in our 40s now (laughs) you know and I stopped dealing with him when I was I want to say 29 and he was like 30 or so um and he got the idea to come back two years ago. And that was after my mom passed. And all of a sudden, like, I just started just talking and talking and talking and talking and about different stuff. And that's not, like, who I am. I don't, like, share stuff about me. But I feel like because my mom passed, it put me in a very vulnerable state that I was never in before in my life. And it just, (laughs) I mean, he hasn't used any of that against me. Like he's kind of, I don't want to say a strange narc. He doesn't do a lot of the classic behaviors that most narcissists do. Like, Obviously, he was, like, jealous and attempting to be controlling, but he never, like, um, like, put me down. He never, like, said anything mean to me. Mm-hmm. He was just very entitled. Oh, yeah. And just, like, wanting to be put first, but not, like ever insulting or trying to like you know I guess attack me as a person if that makes sense um okay just just like very clingy and like kind of like don't leave me energy (laughs) you know like especially back the first eight and a half years I was dealing with him when I was in my 20s that was like his whole thing don't leave me (laughs) like like that desperate and this time he's not like that but at the same time he like you know wanted to monopolize my time like after I started getting used to him and thinking he was safe um and he's also a time waster like that was an another thing. Like he would always be like, "Well, in the future, blah blah blah," you know. Right. In the future, will things will be better in the future? Yeah. So I mean, they're, whatever. They're, like yeah, a future. That's a lot faker. of empty promises. <clears throat> yeah, a future faker. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So and um, so yeah. 
So what's important, guys, and I'm sorry, I just put the um, the link for the podcast. Uh, it's the one from August 30th. Um, and okay. the one that's, that we do tonight will be available probably in three or four days. If, okay, if, if, thank if, you. If I'm connected to credit. You know, okay. um, I do a lot of trauma work. I do a lot of life coaching for emotional abuse work um, and for relationships. And, um, you know, people use a lot of metaphors, you know, talk about what they're, what they're struggling with, especially when it comes to sex. People, I mean, maybe they feel like I don't understand what they're going to talk about or, you know, they're embarrassed, you know. But I noticed that when I start listening over and over again, I hear the same thing. I hear the same thing over and over again. And I look at the pattern and the pattern really is about sex. So, um, you know, it's really easy to believe, you know, what your narcissist tells you, right? It, it's easy to believe because they act so confident. They sound so reasonable and maybe you're used to trusting them, especially at first, like Tim said. The thing is, is that, you know, I don't want to cast um, judgment on people, but narcissists are liars. They're not going to tell you the truth, but here's the, here's one thing that you can always count on, right? You guys hear me talk about your rational brain, your emotional heart. Let me talk about your body, your body being a very accurate, you know, barometer for what the truth is. You can trust your body more than anything and anyone else. So if you feel a certain way during sex, think about sex being the blueprint for the truth about how your relationship looks. You know, when we, when we start finding things out, this discard phase, if that's what happened to you, how many, how many of you have been discarded? How many of you were, you know, just um, pushed away? Can I see your hands? How many of you called the shots and, and did the breakup and, you know, and, and tried to stop the cycle? Okay. So Tim, Nicole, and Jazz, you guys stopped the cycle. And I did also. Kelly, you did also. Okay. So the four of you out of this group. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, but, you know, when we are, when we are ending this relationship, whether we're ending it, whether they're ending it, usually it's them, but I'm proud of you guys for being able to do it. We're very confused because we had seen this person as someone who always said they cared about us, but now we're looking at this person as someone maybe we don't even recognize. Someone who is cruel, someone who doesn't have feelings and doesn't, who just isn't who we thought they were, right? Unmasking the narc. Our head is spinning. Our heart is just devastated. We are just beside ourselves because we don't know what happens. And here we are, people who, if you've been in a relationship for a considerable amount of time, you have been victimized. Okay, right? Like, you know, I don't like the word victim. I use victimized. And we look back over these months, these years trying to figure out what the hell happened. And, you know, once somebody brings up the idea that your partner may or may not be narcissistic or have narcissistic tendencies or traits, we begin to search. We are searching high and low for things that we missed, things that, we, that you know, that we didn't know existed, things that we didn't have names for. And, you know, I have a, um, a list of like these common thoughts that, that people have when we're trying to figure things out. Um, Tim, did you have a question? I want to make sure I answer you before I go on. Uh, I was just going to say that like now that I broke up with her, like everything is my fault. and I did this and I did that. And she's like this hero because we have a two year old together, too. So I broke up the family, yada, yada, yada. Of course you did, Tim. Did you expect anything different? No, not really. You know, it just sucks. She's like, we're going through this custody thing right now. We we haven't even gotten to court because I'm sure she doesn't want to go to court at the moment because she I, we had her quit her job three years ago, and I've been taking care of the money aspect. And yeah, it's, she she just she doesn't even acknowledge any of that. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, but you know what? At least your eyes are wide open at this point. Yeah. Uh, hey, I just want to welcome uh, Caitlin, Jill, Teresa, and Liz. Thanks for being here, guys. Uh, Judy, is your hand up from before or new question or comment? So some of the things that we, and I have been in your shoes, um, a lot of these were my own questions, is what was really the truth about this relationship? You know, is 
is this person that I that I loved even who they say they were? How 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 could I have been so manipulated? And in my own brain, I thought that you know there this was so many years ago that narcissism wasn't even a thing. Like you just thought that people were assholes. Like there was no real term for it. And like when you thought when I thought about it, I was like, am I was I really the cause of everything not working out? Like really, did was it all me? You know, did they ever really love me? Am I am I the I, am I the person that they're saying that I am? How do we heal when we're hearing all this stuff? Thinking about how you act, thinking about maybe that you know you over uh, dramatize this, you know you catastrophize the situation. What if what if we start to think? Are they the innocent one in this? Maybe maybe it is all me. What do we think? What do we think about those thoughts? How do you move forward and start thriving beyond this abuse? Because when we start asking those questions, we kind of describe the truth of what our relationship was and the truth about who the partner really was. What was something that you found out to be true that you had been um, manipulated into not believing throughout, throughout your relationship? Jilly Jill. Tell me something. Hi, I'm in my car. Can you Hello. hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, oh, all sorts of things. Um, the question was, what did I discover that wasn't true? Mm-hmm. Um, he kept saying that his back hurt so bad he couldn't work and all this stuff. And... And then all of a sudden he wants to go to Africa and be, uh, you know, be a safari guy or something. I'm like, really? Thought your back was hurting. You know, <laughs> it, and it's all just a lie to get me to take care of him and for him to lay on the couch and eat my food and sit back and let me earn all the money and pay for everything. And that's not true. Thank you. Anyone else want to share with me? Tell me something that you learned. Tell me something that was eye-opening when you stepped back and you started learning about what this toxic behavior looks like. Well, in the... Who's, I'm first, sorry, I can't, I can't see who's talking. Kelly. Oh, hi. Yes, good. Um, In the first part of dealing with the narcissist, it was all about him. Like, I was... Going to college, I was young, I was like ambitious, I was like, okay, I'm going to go to New York and go to a four-year college, and he just was a hater, like, he didn't want me to do anything, like, he was trying to convince me that, okay, I needed to have a kid with him, <laughs> and I needed to... <laughs> To work full time and financially support him and I would just be like heck no and I would just be like arguing with him about that the whole time like that was literally like the biggest argument we had like trying to get me to agree to financially support him and I was like uh uh because one thing my dad taught me is to never financially support never financially support a man and never let a man live in my house. You know, those those were like the best two things my dad ever taught me. Mm -hmm. And I am going to I'm going to keep on doing that cuz that was genius. Like I forget how old I was when I was, when my dad told me that. I think I might have been 19 or so, or at least, at least 19, maybe probably early 20s or something. It was before I met that guy. Um, and um, that was just the most genius advice. And I would always remember what my dad said. And I would always, like, never you know, want to 
cave in to what the narcissist was saying because I, kn I knew it not to be true and I knew it was not right for me. I knew he was a leech, you know, and he was at that time, he was like always really complaining about his job and saying he wanted to quit his job and getting really frustrated and angry and just, I don't even know what the problem was. Like there really was no problem, but he was like creating drama about it. Like, you know what I'm saying? And that's, that's, um, pretty, that's pretty accurate, though. Creating the drama, right? Yeah, and it's like, I couldn't really even figure <laughs> out what was wrong. But <clears throat> um, his mom was financially supporting him. And I would always tell him during that entire time, look, you need to get some goals. You need to get your act together, you need to get a job, you know, and you need to help your mother out financially, and you need to stop this. Basically lecturing him, because I was so mad about the stupid stuff he was doing and telling me about. Yeah. And he finally <laughs> listened. He finally listened. Surprise, surprise. He, oh, okay. he was helping his mother out she was able to retire and he was financially supporting him, her or he was he was financially supporting his mother after she retired and i was like oh wow he actually listened to me <laughs> oh good thank you i thanks for thanks for sharing i appreciate it yeah hey, I want to welcome uh lady james claudia and anna thanks for being here guys um so <clears throat> we were talking about you know, how sometimes we feel very diminished uh, because of our intimacy or our sex life with our narcissistic person. And um, I was in a group in my doctorate program where we interviewed um, people who had been married, you know, 17 or even more up to, I think it was 17 to 20 years, right? So these people weren't like, you know, newlyweds, they weren't starting fresh. You know, they had explained to us that, you know, relationships are really hard work, um, but of course these particular people that we interviewed for this segment, they were not married to narcissistic people, but their sex life revealed the truth of what they felt as well as what they experienced in their marriage. Right. Because like I mentioned a few minutes ago, that sex is such a reflection of the truth of what your relationship is. It also demonstrates that you can trust yourself. So some of the things that we had heard during this, um, and this was way back, um, in 20, 15, um, we heard people, women and men both say things like, I feel loved and safe when I'm with my partner. I feel beautiful. I feel sexy when I'm with him or her. Um, he or she is very gentle and attentive. Um, it feels playful. We heard a lot. We heard he or she is very sensitive and kind. We heard, I feel very connected. We heard things like, um, there was one person who said the sex is fun and we used this, um, in one of our narcissistic groups to help people who were in, you know, um, sexual narcissistic relationships to understand that if you're not feeling, you don't have to feel every single one of these things, but if you're not feeling this and you're feeling something's off, your body is not feeling one of these ways, then we need to take a step back. And Tim, you had said, like after the first year kissing her was, it was like, felt like it was a different person. Yeah. And you can just add everything else to that too. It was almost like, it was like, a like if I wanted to have sex, she didn't, or it, it was just weird. Every, every time it was, it was like, I shouldn't be having sex with her the, the entire time. It was, it was just weird. It did not feel right. And now like to this day, <clears throat> it's like, I, I don't even want to have sex right now. I like, I know interest in going out and chasing tail or whatever you know like i just don't even want to engage in it well you're still healing so i think that's i think it's pretty smart right thing to do um anyone else any of those resonate with maybe some, something that maybe that you that you have a relationship now that maybe you didn't before or maybe something very counterproductive to or uh, um that can counter something i said where you didn't feel a connection where your brain and your heart were just not in it, you know, we kind of go through the motions. 
Because like I said earlier, sex is one of the most vulnerable activities of our whole life. You know, um, our toxic person usually takes this, you know, this sacred act of being intimate and being vulnerable and uses it against us. They quiet us. You know, they kind of kill our spirit. Um, I have one lady who said that it drained the life from her. We've talked about the emotional vampire. So, you know, um, I can't remember where I heard this story, but it's actually really, it's, a, it's about a shaman. Um, you know, shamans are spiritual and emotional hearers of, among um, the indigenous um, civilizations. Uh, people go to them and look for healing, right? And one of the first questions that this shaman asked in the story I was reading, he asked this young girl, he said, when did you stop singing? And she kind of looked at him with like this, this confusion in her face. And he said that a lot of times when you are in a relationship that is healthy and then go to one that is abusive, your light, your life, it slowly diminishes without noticing. So the shaman asking this girl when she stopped singing was his way of, of, of having her be aware that it had stopped, forgetting that she ever used to love it. And I wonder if that's happened to any of you guys. Jill, you had your hand up? Oh, I'm trying to push buttons and drive. Sorry. Um, yes, I slowly lost myself. I was happy. I was... I was a happy, optimistic person. I was always in a good mood. I was always lifting people up. Um, and then just slowly that joy that I had about me, about my personality, just slowly went away. And I got so depressed yeah. about the whole situation because I lost all of that all of that positivity and happiness and joy in my life. It's like, it, and I think he, he robbed me of that because everything that I used to love to do, I, I didn't get to do that with him anymore because he didn't want to do it anymore. And of course I can go and do it with my friends, but that's not the same thing as doing it with your partner that you yep. used to enjoy it with. And that but. was very stifling. But you know what? I'm going to ask you. I know some of your uh -huh. story, and we talked last week. Uh -huh. Did you have fun with your friends watching the games this weekend? I sure did. I had the best time, and I got my got my mojo back, got my football back. Good girl. No, and listen, sometimes we just have to rely on our friends, period. Yes, yes. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Jazz. Yeah, so for me, um, that the singing part really resonated with me because – so it was singing, but it was also when I would look at babies, I didn't feel anything for them. And I used to be like, oh my gosh, like I love this baby. Or, you know, like you want to pick them up. I would, I would look at babies and I wouldn't feel a thing. I would be numb. I would also look at puppies and I would feel numb. Um, okay. And I stopped having um, parties. And um, I recently had my first party um, because um, my narcissist, my emotional vampire, he finally, um, our lease was up and I was like, you can't be moving in with me because, you know, you didn't have a job for two years. Um, you got to go. So he finally was, you know, obviously like there was like a lot of back and forth and we were fighting over it, but he finally left and I have like my own place and I finally had like my first brunch with my friends. And so that was, that was like a turning point for me that I was like, it, it was just really great because I, I knew like I, I finally did it, you know, cause uh, I could see like um, probably like a year ago, that was when um, I noticed that I started to get better was when, you know, um, I would look at babies, you know, again, Aww, um, yeah, and, you know, and I would want to like hug them and, you know, and, and then um, same thing with like puppies. Um, yeah. So that happened. And then, so, each time like that happened and then having that brunch with my friends um, just showed that I was healing. Good. Good for you. Thanks for sharing. Hey, Tim. Yeah. Like I'm supposed to be in the recording studio this week uh, and you know, I sing and play guitar and I just have no desire to go sing my heart out, which sucks. Cause like I do, 
I, I feel like I want, like I should want to, I, I feel like I want to right now, but at the same time, like the thought of going and picking up my guitar and singing, just like, I feel like I don't have the energy to push it out. And it's, it's annoying as hell. Well, I hope that you do begin to sing again. I do. Like I, I do like sometimes, like sometimes I get in the mood and then I'll do it. You know, like I, I do, but not as much as I used to. And it's, I really, really want to get back to that because I'm that that had a lot to do with my therapy too. I mean, I write songs about life, you know, and, and it's that was very therapeutic for me. And now it's like I don't have that. Like I, my, I'm looking at my guitar sitting on the wall right now. And it's like I absolutely love that thing, and I love the songs that I write. But so I'm going to tell you guys something. You will sing again, every every single one of you. Yeah, I know I will. It just sucks at the moment. Yeah, it does. Hey, Judy. Hi. With mine, uh, the majority of my relationships on the sex end, it had been spontaneous and loving. But with this person, after a few years, it became a duty and or a payment. I'd say, well, what about this? Or even things with the house, or let's do this, or things that had to be done in a typical relationship. And the person would say, well, I need this right now, this way. So it was a payment. And that was very strange. Okay. All right. So it was like you owed him. Hey, Kelly. Hey, um, so yesterday I was watching a YouTube video by this, this guy who, uh, does videos about narcissists. His name is Dinesh Bashir. And he did like a short video about how dealing with (laughs) narcissists interrupts a woman's period, her cycle. And it knocks all the hormones off because of the stress. And it causes irregularity and all of that and just unwellness, right? And so, like... I would say the second year I was in college, um, I was dealing with my narc um, and him pestering me about not like doing some of the stuff that I wanted to do and just kind of putting his expectations on me. All of that stress, sure enough, messed up my period and... I ended up developing um, uterine fibroids, and um, I also believe back then it was like the start of my thyroid problems, but I didn't get that checked out until like the, I want to say the following year, or even even like two years after like my heavy period started and stuff. the doctor was like, well, your thyroid levels are a little bit elevated. And then that was around the time when I was going back to New York because I had to take a two and a half year break. And um, so when I went back, I never really checked on it. And ever since then, I just really been having really like chronic fatigue and stuff. And it can definitely take a toll on your body, honey. Exactly. Things that happen. And I I was, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I hope you start to feel better. Thank you. I mean, little by little, I'm feeling better just because I'm like keeping regular, regularly taking my iron and my vitamin D. That's helped tremendously. Um, But I'm a caregiver also. So that adds a whole nother dimension of issues on having like chronic illness. But my point really is I was like wow so so the guy on YouTube Dinesh he actually proved my problems started with dealing with the narcissist and that was a few years into it anyway it didn't like start out that way with my periods and I was like wow dude I can't believe this yeah, no, well, thanks for sharing. And I'm sure that, you know, everyone else, that, that sometimes we have autoimmune diseases that happen, a lot of things. Thanks for sharing. Hey, Alex. Oh, Christine, do you need to go? No, no, I, you're good. 
Uh, there's there's thunder here for narcissist apocalypse. It's perfect. <laughs> um, but I was super bubbly before, and I feel like I'm finally getting that back. Um, my periods also were messed up. I went to the gyno, and he was like, you can't have a baby. But I didn't want a baby at the time, so it was like a win-win. Um, but I uh, stopped reading my Bible. That was the first thing. So once I noticed it was like encroaching on like the spiritual spiritual component of my life, that's when yeah. I started to make changes. And then also like I couldn't play the harmonica. Like he was pissed off. Um, and then my emotional immaturity came out, and then I just started playing uh, Alanis Morissette harmonica songs, which pissed him off even more. But yeah, but that's what happened with me. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing. And you know, like I said, our bodies are the, are the biggest reaction. We have to start listening to our bodies most of all, most and foremost. You know, um, like I said, this is an assault. It's assaults on our body. It's psychological abuse. It, um, you know, you were left with feeling less than, for the words that I like to use, maybe unwanted, less desirable. <clears throat> the truth of the matter is, though, this is not your fault. It was never about you, and it was never your fault. And honestly, the fact that this happened to you is never a small deal. It's never a small thing. This is a this is a this is a trauma with no visible scars, but your body and your spirit feel it. It's important to allow yourself to recognize, you know, that this happened, number one, and two, to give yourselves the grace you need. Um, you know, what you're feeling is very valid, very important, and I'm glad that you guys are here to share and to listen to other people. That's really important. Being kind to yourself is going to be one of the ways that you can help get yourself through this. You hear me use the words, give yourself grace. You deserve love and gentleness. So try to be that for yourself. You know, we talked last um, session about compassion, self-compassion. The more you take care of yourself and treat yourself with, you know, we'll use the words exquisite kindness. The more your body will get used to feeling that this is what we love and what we deserve. And we will tend to not want anything from anything less from anyone else moving forward, right? You grow stronger and stronger every single day. Um, and one day you realize, wow, I, I made it through this and I know what I'm capable of. I know what I deserve. I know my worth and I'm not going to settle for anything less. We deserve someone who always is able to give you the pleasure that you are able to give back, right? We always talk about reciprocity. You want someone who genuinely cares about you. And, you know, I think like when I did that study with my friends, we look at the people who have been married a long time, even though they say marriage isn't easy, it really isn't, but they still felt very loved. They felt very secure. They felt a connection. And I think once we get ourselves to a place where we know all these things and we can, and we can get out of our funk that we're in, we'll be able to really experience what love looks like you know, enabled to be thriving beyond what our toxic person did to us. Ladies and gentlemen, I do need to go. Um, I will be back next episode at six o'clock. Um, so if you want to join me, that would be wonderful. If not, then I will see you tomorrow. Um, if you are new to Circles, thanks so much for being here, for me being your first um, Circle. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're not following me, please do so. And as always, leave me your feedback. I appreciate you guys being here. Thank you so, so much. Have a wonderful night if I don't see you in a few minutes. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. I did, just so you guys know, I did put the Spotify link in the, um, in the chat. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome very much. Have a good night, guys. You too, bye. Bye-bye. Mm-mm. <clears throat>